Taxi Driver 738 again. Pacific Points. Making the points at all Shell of Foodies. Jack in the Box, Cabo Enterprises, IT&E. This is the link. Morning, Chief of Police. Chief Steve Ignacio joins us in the KUAM News Zoom Room. Good morning, Chief. Thank you for your time. No problem, Chris. Good morning. Morning, morning. Today. All right. Uh, we'll just get right into it. Uh, Sabrina's on leave, so you got me and Jason. Uh, but we, we wanted to start something we haven't heard about uh, in a bit is this uh, extradition case of Nicholas Moore. Uh, as the prime suspect in the uh, alleged uh, murder of Michael Castro. Have there been any updates? Has Mr. Moore been uh, returned to Guam? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Uh, as, as I said, uh, he's still in the custody of the United States Marshal Service. And so until such time that uh, they bring him back to Guam, uh, we'll know more as to where we uh, go from, from there. Uh, but no, he's still in their custody, so I don't know what the movements are. And I'm sure uh, we're, we're not going to know uh, for purposes of security mm. uh, until he gets here. Have there been any other uh, arrests uh, in this case? Uh, none that I'm tracking. Uh, but, you know, I do know that there's still a lot of uh, investigative work that's being done by criminal investigation. And so uh, we continue to move forward in that. Well, that's uh, encouraging. Uh, Chief, so can, can you kind of explain uh, a little bit uh, just generally on the ex extradition process just for maybe uh, some of us who aren't familiar with it, like what it entails, timeline? Sure. So, so with, uh, with the, the Nicholas Moore case, uh, it was a little bit different from what I, what, uh, I was used to. I've actually done um, three uh, extraditions uh, to Guam. Uh, I did one in St. Louis, I'm sorry, Palmyra, Missouri, which is about eight hours out from St. Louis. Uh, I did one to Chuk, and I did one in Saipan. So it was very different. Um, my experiences were very different. Uh, as a matter of fact, I brought that, that experience to, uh, to the team, and they're like, no, Chief, that's not how it's done uh, now, nowadays. I said, okay. So we, they kind of walked me through. And so what it is is that uh, we brought our case uh, to the U.S. Marshals, and uh, they presented it before uh, the district court judge and uh, a warrant was issued for unlawful flight to avoid prosecution. Uh, meaning that, you know, uh, uh, Moore uh, left Guam uh, because of the ongoing investigation and the fact that, uh, you know, there may be evidence against him that uh, could bring charges for uh, the murder. And so once we turned it over to the US Marshals and they got the, uh, what's called the UFAP, unlawful flight to avoid prosecution warrant, uh, everything now falls into their hands. Uh, they uh, go out and send their teams. Uh, you know, they have a bigger, uh, uh, they, they have jurisdiction throughout the United States. So um, they were able to track down uh, Mr. Moore's uh, location in Florida um, once they got the warrant. And uh, we uh, we actually send, um, and then, you know, these are the things that we do that we don't always normally uh, publicly talk about. but. Uh, as we, this thing progressed uh, and we were coordinating with the U.S. Marshal Service, uh, we actually sent uh, two of our uh, agents from criminal investigation uh, out to Florida uh, to work with um, uh, the U.S. Marshals so, so that once they picked up uh, Nicholas Moore, uh, we could step in and uh, attempt to conduct an interrogation or interview regarding the, the case. And of course, um, I'm not sure what the outcome was or whether or not he provided any statements, uh, but, you know, we were there when he was picked up. And then, you know, we went around and did uh, investigative work. You know, we talked to whoever he may have been living with, whether it's just a family, a friend, a relative, and see if that they had any information as to um, that they could provide that may be helpful in the uh, uh, investigation that we're conducting. And uh, once that's done, uh, he's brought before that, that uh, court in uh, Florida. And at that point, you know, uh, he determines, uh, they, they determine of whether or not um, he can be extradited back to Guam based on the, the warrant issued by the, uh, the court here in Guam, the district court. Uh, and it's my understanding that uh, uh, Nicholas, Nicholas Moore did not uh, contest uh, his identity. And uh, so he agreed to be flown back to Guam in the custody of the U.S. Marshals. So that's where we're at now. And, uh, you know, we're, we're working on get, getting him back home so that we can proceed in the local court. Are the uh, two officers that uh, were sent off to Florida when he was apprehended, are they, have they returned to Guam? Uh, yes, they're back on island already. Yeah, they're back home safe. 
Uh, what about the issue of the uh, drug test, uh, Chief? I know we had uh, followed up with you, was it like a week, week or two ago? Uh, have all the officers uh, been tested, and what can you share with our audience? Sure. Uh, matter of fact, um, if you don't see me for a little bit, let me just open up that email. Okay. And so, Chris, we, we tested a total of 163 employees uh, out of the entire police department, which represents about, um, I think, 75%. So we, we actually almost reached our goal. There, there may have, been, may have been a couple here and there that um, weren't tested. And uh, for various reasons, either they were on sick leave, annual leave, uh, off-island, or uh, even military leave. Uh, but uh, we, we did uh, do, do quite a few. Uh, tests for employees and uh, got to report that all the tests came back uh, negative. Oh, wow. And then, uh, so you mentioned that some may have missed it uh, because of uh, various uh, commitments. Do you then kind of go back and uh, make an effort to test everyone who didn't or are we just stopping? Uh, we, we, we could, but, you know, as you see the trend, you know, all of our officers are and our employees uh, because some of the, the civilian employees actually fall into a, a test designated position. Mm -hmm. Uh, for example, our criminalists, it's on my understanding that our criminalists uh, were subjected to testing uh, because of the fact that they deal with um, uh, drug evidence and, uh, you know, uh, they work in that environment. So they were sub some of them were subjected to the random tests. Uh, and again, uh, all of our employees tested uh, negative. So, you know, uh, I, I guess, you know, I'm comfortable uh, that I can move on and then, you know, maybe follow up uh, testing maybe next year uh, if, you know, if time permits. Are you obviously you're pleased uh, with the results, Chief? Oh yes, absolutely. You know, it it, it shows you know that our officers are above board and uh, you know adhering to uh, the the law, and you know uh, we we can count on them and we can trust them. Uh, it's very very, uh, very very good results. Can can you give us an update on the uh, so there was that project U, and then there was like a COVID case, right? And that threw everybody involved with that into uh, quarantine. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, uh, glad to report uh, they came back on the, I think last week, Wednesday, was the new uh, start date. And so we just kind of pushed everything to the right. And so, you know, of course, the uh, completion date is probably sometime in July. But, uh, you know, I had a chance to meet some of the kids. You know, it's a very small group, a uh, very small, intimate group. So we had um, six of them showed up uh, when I met them, I believe, uh, Monday of this week. And uh, we're a maximum of 10. So it's a very small group, but, uh, you know, I'm excited, you know, because we have these kids and we're able to work with them and, uh, you know, be a positive um, influence in their life. And, you know, we teach them life skills. So uh, there's a lot of great partners, you know, Thrive, uh, Trades Academy, uh, Manietlu, um, you know, DYA, Guam Behavioral Health. You know, there's a whole bunch of people that came forward and says, you know, we, we, we like the project. We want to be a part of it. And, uh you know, uh, we're here to support you and uh, come come out and uh, give give our all to it too. So uh, DOE as well. So it's it's moving, and uh, I'm glad to report that um, you know uh, no, no other positives, and uh, we can continue. And um, yeah, the other thing, Chris, is uh, this Friday. You know, I, let me just be the first to announce that this Friday we'll be uh, doing our swearing in. Uh, of our new police recruits, and they'll be hitting the streets uh, come Sunday. And uh, they'll, they'll be. This will be their uh, swearing in just for the OJT. But you know, at this point, you know, moving forward, uh, they're, they're going to have all the uh, duties and responsibilities of a full-time peace officer, able to make arrests, take complaints, and all that. And so uh, we'll be swearing in 21 new recruits, and uh, they'll be out assisting with our our shortage in the, the police department. Uh, they'll be working with their field training officers, and you know, get them. Um, Get him to experience uh, r real, uh, real life uh, police work, Chief. Uh, so how, when they get folded into the rotation, <clears throat> what does that mean in terms of you moving around uh, personnel who maybe had been moved somewhere to cover shortages that these recruits are not going to fill? Yeah. So, so once they they're done with their um, OJT, uh, which is uh, uh, eight eight weeks, uh, we're going to be doing uh, two weeks per precinct, uh, just so that they can. Uh, experience each precinct because you know i'll tell you uh i we all know uh, police officers all know that uh precincts are very different um the type of people you deal with um the nature of the work the amount the workload uh is very different from precinct to precinct you know it may be a little bit 
slower down south, but it allows the officers to be more proactive, make, make uh, be able to patrol more, pull over more cars, and then that's where we run into the, the possession cases, right? Uh, the street level possession cases of uh, drug paraphernalia. Uh, you get up to Dedero, and you know you just you can't you know, can't keep up, you know, in Dedero sometimes, you know, because uh, we cover Dedero and Jigo. There's multiple calls. I mean, it's not unusual sometimes, you know, that Dedero would have to call uh, to morning to kind of move up and help uh, cover down because there's two riots going on at the same time. Uh, mm -hmm. That That's not unusual up in the, the north. Uh, to morning again, is a, a different animal because, you know, uh, there's no more tourists, right? There's very little tourists, if none at all. So that that dynamic has pretty, uh, pretty much changed down in uh, Tawani. Uh, and then we go to the central area and we cover the most villages with the, you know, we, we have the most mayors there and uh, uh, population that's uh, almost equal to the north, uh, but just more area to cover because multiple jurisdictions. Yeah, so uh, they, they get to experience all of that. Uh, they get to do a two week rotation, work night shift, work day shift. Uh, come back in eight weeks, and then we prepare them for their formal uh, ceremony, the graduation, and they head back out. You know, those that have performed well uh, during OJT, uh, they're recommended to uh, go out and patrol on their own. Uh, sometimes um, those that don't, uh, you know, perform that 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 well, you know, we continue to put them through with an FTO, and so you know, we get to a comfortable place that uh, they can function uh, on their own. But uh, as far as the shortage, you know, of course, first priority is, and I've always said this, Chris, is um, making sure that we have enough officers on patrol. And uh, once, you know, we are comfortable that we can at least establish a minimum coverage for patrol and, and meet that minimum coverage, uh, then, you know, we're, we're gonna have to look at moving officers to possibly, uh, my next priority will probably be investigations bureau. Mm. Uh, because cases that don't get closed at the patrol level uh, end up at Investigations Bureau of CID, uh, CIS, you know, criminal investigation, juvenile investigation, uh, and uh, those places. So, you know, that's where the, the, the need, uh, the next need would be. And, uh, and you know, uh, that, that's what we're doing. You know, uh, just this week, I was informed again that um, I, I think, I don't know if I reported last week that I lost uh, yeah, a civilian. Yeah. Yeah, and a police officer, but uh, again, uh, this week, you know, I had another officer who actually works in one of uh, the small offices here under the chief of police. Uh, he'll be retiring soon. And uh, another officer I heard is going to be submitting his letter of uh, retirement soon as well. So this week uh, I'll be having to be processing uh, two retirements. Well, you, Chief, I ran into a retired officer uh, over the weekend and um, they were they were talking about a uh, program. I'm not even sure if it's just something that was discussed or if it's uh, in the works or or not. But a program to bring back uh, retired officers as reservists um, is that just something that's being talked about, or was there an offer made, or can you tell us anything on that? So uh, you know, we we we've, we've told uh, the, the retirees that you know if they want to come back. Uh, you know, they're, they're more than welcome. Actually, during the, the pandemic. Uh, we actually picked up one former officer uh, and one retired police officer. As a matter of fact, the retired police officer is still working with us, and they actually don't come back as a reserve. Uh, they actually come back as a full-time uh, police officer. Uh, I think the only thing is that they don't receive um, retirement benefit. We don't pay into their retirement because they're already retired. Uh -huh. Uh, and then we don't, uh, they don't accrue annual sick leave is my understanding of that. Uh, that's what's, what's allowed under the budget law. But uh, we, we did pick up uh, one one retired police officer and he's still uh, on board with us. Um, and he's still working actually out of the Dedero precinct. Wow. And uh, the, the, the other officer, of course, you know, her uh, one year came up and uh, she decided that it's time for her to move on. Uh, we've always opened it up for our retirees and, uh, you know, we've talked about them coming back. You know, they, they wanted to help. Uh, one of the things that, you know, that I've always, has always been a hindrance uh, sometimes is uh, um, the fact that, you know, they have to meet the, the post requirements as well. Mm. And so, you know, they have to be subjected to a polygraph, a background, and a psyche valve. And, uh, you know, retiree, you know, they, they've spent uh, all their time, but uh, r really, um, you know, it's always been open. Um, We've tried to get, we were trying to get a police reserve cycle uh, up and started uh, or up and running, but 
you know, our challenge is that, you know, we, we went through like 20 applicants and only six of them uh, actually meet that requirement of having um, the, the basic law enforcement academy or the CJ Academy from GCC. Uh, and that's only so that it can minimize the amount of training that we, we right. put into it because they've already received, you know, probably 80, 90% of it. But, uh, you know, we can't start an academy with six people. You know, it just doesn't make any sense. So when you talk about like retired um, officers who have come back and, and augmented uh, the force, what about like uh, uh, not just beat cops, but like detectives or other maybe former high ranking officers who have some of that, what do you call it, uh, institutional knowledge maybe to bring uh, to the table? Has that ever been kind of a... Talk about yeah, we, you know, I, I've actually talked to a couple of them and, uh, you know, some of them, uh, you know, do, do want to come back. Some of them do want to um, uh, contribute again to the department. Uh, uh, but, you know, uh, sometimes we just talk about it and we never have a follow-up conversation uh, on it. But, you know, uh, they're more than welcome, you know, uh, uh, come by, let, let's talk about it and see what we can do. Because, yeah, I mean, we, we, we appreciate all the help we can get. And, uh, you know, it's nice, you know, that uh, the retirees uh, still have their, their heart uh, in the Guam Police Department and, you know, their, their, their heart's in the right place. You know, they want to help the community. So we welcome that as well. Right on. Uh, Chief, you know, we are able to, uh, we're going to be debuting uh, next week the um, podcast that uh, you did with Sabrina. Uh, I don't mm. want to give away too much of it, right? So th- we're, right. Sabrina's got this great podcast. Uh, it's called Crimes Without Convictions. And it's kind of a, a cold case um podcast where she looks at a lot of uh big cases in guam's history where a conviction was not secured uh that being said chief uh what is the because it kind of got me thinking like the status of some of our uh and this case was not a cold case right because it did go through the court uh, system but what is the status of like cold cases not just the ones that we have uh more recently but in, in the past how do you kind of determine what cases, if any, or I mean, is that even something that is part of your day to day? What cases can we take another look at or maybe reopen uh, to seek closure? Yeah. So, uh, you know, Chris, I remember again, going back to, to my experience, uh, back in 2000, I was actually in charge of, uh, the second, uh, version or the second iteration of, uh, the unsolved homicide task force, uh, and one of the cases I actually worked on is that one I talked about where we went to Saipan to pick up uh, an individual who was wanted for a murder in the 70s. Uh, so it was, you know, we were able to successfully close an unsolved homicide. But, you know, uh, unfortunately, the following year, you know, 9-11 occurred and uh, unsolved homicide teams just... Uh, uh, so before 9-11, uh, unsolved homicide teams were actually uh, something that most uh, law enforcement agencies and... Um, even that the military law enforcement agencies are actually developed these teams. Yeah. Uh, I remember uh, there was a team from uh, Navy Criminal Investigation Service, NCIS. Um, they actually had an unsolved team come out to Guam because they actually have one unsolved homicide that occurred in a Navy base here in Guam. And so, uh, you know, we were coordinating some information and sharing with them. Uh, throughout the United States, there were a lot of uh, unsolved homicide teams that were being developed because, you know, uh, Forensics has advanced, uh, you know, DNA has advanced to the point now where um, they're doing something, you know, very, very different called a familial DNA, you know, where you have this DNA database and if somebody closely related to the actual homicide suspect, this DNA gets put put in, you know, that, that database, you know, kind of tells the police department, uh, the, the detectives, hey, look, you know, uh, somebody related to this guy whose DNA you just put in, uh, somebody closely related to him uh, is matches the DNA from this unsolved homicide from many years ago. So I, there's at least two cases where I read a little bit about it in, uh, I think, San Francisco. Mm-hmm. Um, they, they actually solved a series of uh, unsolved homicides from a serial killer wow. based on familial DNA. So, uh, you know, 9-11 occurred. The, the unsolved homicide team just kind of went away. Uh, I think there was an attempt once uh, to bring it back, and uh, they did do some work on some of the cases. I'm not sure how far that went, but um, you know, uh, we, we we do that when you know when we have the personnel. And I love more than anything, I'd love to put an unsolved homicide team together. Uh, you know, that's where I think you know uh, those retired police officers who 
have intimate knowledge of these cases because they were around when they occurred, I think they would be of great uh, benefit to the department uh, in, in that respect. And I, I welcome that, you know, once we, hopefully, you know, once we get there uh, and, you know, we, we get enough people. But yeah, uh, unsolved homicide teams uh, do work. Uh, I've seen them work. I, I worked on a, a couple um, that, you know, uh, we close one or two, but, you know, the, unfortunately, some of the others, we've worked on them for years. Uh, and uh, we, we just never got anywhere, you know, just not enough evidence or, you know, just we could, could move forward. Right. Chief, just last question. So uh, it's resources, it's manpower to, to kind of re-stand up and unsolve the murder task force. But what about the, the evidence, the case files? Uh, in the event that we did do that or, or look at uh, any of these cold cases, are we positive that all of the relative uh, case data is still in a condition that we can work with? Uh, I'm sure they are. Uh, you know, we, we have an evidence control section and we have a, a evidence storage. Uh, so, you know, I, I think that's where, Chris, um, what, what's going to be beneficial uh, is when we get the DNA lab up and running. And so that's uh, about a year out. Uh, it's gonna open up, you know, uh, it's my understanding that we're probably gonna be finished with the building with this year. We'll be able to equip it, but by the time we, we get the, the personnel trained and to actually um, get them spun up to doing actual DNA analysis, uh, we're looking at maybe about a year, maybe a year and a half out. But at some point it will get done and we will get there and uh, we can actually start creating, uh, you know, possibly a DNA database so that uh, as things go along and we start to uh, collect DNA from uh, different uh, offenders that, you know, are required to submit DNA, uh, you know, who, who knows, we may get a break one of these days. Right on, Chief. Th thank you for your time. Very interesting uh, discussion this morning and I appreciate uh, you coming on. No problem. I'll see you guys uh, Friday at the swimming in. Make there sure you go. Okay, that's that. Thank you, uh, Chief Steve Ignacio. Uh, good news there. Takeaways are swearing in 21 uh, new police recruits on Friday, and then they're going to head out with their OJT, with their FTOs. Guys, that's police talk. Uh, they're on the job training with their field.